Good evening. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Q&A live from the ABC studios in South Bank in Brisbane. I'm Virginia Trioli, here to answer your questions tonight. Innovation strategist, Monica Bradley. The Catholic Archbishop of Brisbane, Mark Coleridge. The Queensland Premier, Anastasia Palaszczuk. Former National Senate Leader, Ron Boswell, and Professor Anne Tiernan from the Centre for Governance and Public Policy. Please welcome our panel. Thank you. We have some terrific questions to go to tonight, and so many of them. So let's go straight to the first. It comes tonight from Glen Long. Welcome to Queensland, Virginia, and panel. My first Thank question you for is, having us. who has flown here by helicopter tonight? Anyone? <laughs> Not this bishop. <laughs> no, well, I can say I've never been in a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, you're okay. Okay, so the first question is, of course, about entitlements. All right, Monica Bradley? I mean, the issue really is, uh, I guess, about where, where we go from here when it comes to the issue of entitlements. I think it's a Justin Bieber effect myself. You know, perhaps, I think everyone that goes into politics, as I know them, really goes in to do public good. You know, people, it's a hard job. You, you could earn more on an hourly rate working at McDonald's than being a politician with the hours you have to work. So, for me, it's really about what happens once you get in there that transforms you, that these things seem that they're normal. So I would be questioning what's the culture we've created there um, and actually just get a bit of a reality check. So perhaps politicians should spend, I don't know, a day a week doing an ordinary job, like one of us. Mark Coleridge, you've never flown anywhere by helicopter. I have never been in a helicopter, but uh, I do know, as Monica says, that politicians are very poorly paid. And, uh, <laughs> did, did, did the Premier tell you that no, before you came not. on air or something? Okay. But, but the, the, uh, the fact is, for the, the, the workload they have, the responsibility they bear, and all of that, the intrusion into private life, politicians are not well paid. And I say that as a non-politician. Uh, but nonetheless, there is, I think, not just in, in political life here, uh, in Australia generally, there's a bit of a culture of entitlement. There's something about us Aussies, I think, we, we want a lot for a little. And, and that can creep up in political life as well. I actually think it's aggravated by the fact that the Parliament House in Canberra, and I lived in Canberra for a number of years, is a kind of a world unto itself. And there you've got the Speaker of the House in her big chair, and she has the nicest office in the whole of the Parliament. <laughs> so I think with that beautiful office and the big chair, the culture of entitlement might be a particular trap for... Uh, for someone like the Speaker. Oh, but I, I don't, don't think it's just the Speaker. <laughs> I think it might be political life and it might be the culture more generally, all of us here. People in high office in the Catholic Church get nice big offices and, and nice <laughs> we, big we, chairs too. We do, but I repeat, I have never <laughs> flown in a helicopter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he was... <laughs> He was already going to heaven and now we know that he really is. Um, Premier, is it time for a massive revision when it comes to allowances, travel allowances in particular? Well, I think you've got to always bear in mind what the public would think about it. And is it acceptable to use taxpayers' money flying in a helicopter to a political fundraiser? It's an integrity issue and the answer is clearly no. I mean, use your good judgement. Anyone would know that's not the right thing to do and therefore it should not have happened. No, but this has happened right across the political spectrum from time to time. We get these stories, we get these outrages. There's a breakout on the left, the right and the centre. Looking at allowances, do they need to be wound back? Well, there's different allowances. Um, people try to meet those guidelines. But once again, it's about an integrity issue. And people have to ask themselves before they undertake travel or whether they're using taxpayers' money, is it being used in the public good? And does it pass that threshold test? And if it doesn't pass the threshold test, don't do it. Ron Boswell? Look, it is um, a difficult question whether you, when you debate entitlements. Um, clearly, uh, that was not the right thing to do. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Ronnie has paid a pretty high price for it. Well, she's still got a job. She's still got a job and she'll probably maintain a job. But it, it, could it happen this way? Look, and I, I, just, I just put this to the panel because sometimes these ha things happen. I've got to be on a plane, I've got to be at uh, Geelong and I've got to get back uh, and I've got to be in Sydney tomorrow morning. How do I get there? You, t you fix it up. You fix it up. Tell one of the staffers to fix it up. Now, I'm giving her the best, uh, the best possible way that it could have happened. That may have happened. But clearly... Getting a helicopter down to 
Geelong. Just doesn't pass the test. But look, it's a difficult job, this. It's trying to like define what the Governor General's um, role is. And you can't classify it. You can't say, what are you in charge of? It just, you just can't specify what the entitlements can be used are, for. Are the entitlements such at the moment that they, they are too open to abuses? Would, it, would a bit more tightening up of the guidelines around no, that solve that problem? I think if you want to problem? abuse the entitlements, you can always do it, mm -hmm. no matter how tight they are. It has got to be a matter of trust, and uh, most people do follow a very strong okay. entitlement line. But, Ronnie, are you more likely to slip up the longer you've been in the parliament? Now, you were in the parliament for about a thousand years. <laughs> <laughs> and Bronwyn Bishop is also someone who's been just about 30 years, I think, in the parliament. I mean, is it true the longer you're there, the more you take for granted and the more you're likely to no, slip up? No, I don't think so. Look, I think this episode of Bronnie Bishop and the helicopter has been done to death. I think it's time we moved on. It's time we left that alone. <laughs> I mean, how many, how, how much, how many times can you beat this up? It's well, been beat up for th three weeks. There's a lot of important issues out there: jobs, uh, housing, and, all these sorts. And of we're things. going to get to all of them mm. tonight. But I just want to hear from um, Antinan because, I mean, this is part of what you do. This is. Not take helicopters, Virginia. Obviously, no, no, you take helicopters, <laughs> but um, I'd like a dollar for every uh, review of entitlements that's been conducted in the federal parliament um, over these issues. And you're quite right. This has happened under uh, successive yeah. governments. I mean, to me, the optics of it are so bad. Um, and clearly, uh, many of Brom and Bishop's colleagues are, are very discomforted by that, as they rightly should be. Um, I think, you know, the thing that strikes me is at the same time, it's about the coherence of the message. At the same time as you're uh, wanting to end the age of entitlement, Entitlement that you're talking to people about tightening their belts. Uh, a $5,000 uh, helicopter fare is about 30% of what a pensioner lives on, and people just know something that isn't fair. So I think, you know, I think she's rightly, uh, Ron, and no one doubts how, how hard politicians work. I, I do a lot of research on that, and, and, and I absolutely uh, accept that. What I don't understand is why federal politicians continue to resist an oversight body uh, of the kind that exists in the state that's existed here for a really long time and in New South Wales and elsewhere. You just don't have this stuff because it becomes so transparent uh, and there's a power of investigation that's not done within the bureaucracy uh, as is happening in the Department of Finance now. I think it's... You know, we don't need to do another review. There's any number of entitlement reviews. I yep. can point you to them all if you need to find them uh, on the relevant section of the website. Um, I think it's just a bad look. Uh, and I really think, you know, Ron sort of suggested, and I think it's true, that the issues are delegated to staffers often. People are busy. But at the end of the day, ministers and office holders are accountable. Okay. Um, and I think the more immediate disclosure would really help or an oversight body would be my suggestion. Well, as Ron has suggested, let's move on to more substantial issues. Our next question comes now from Georgina Quayle. Uh, my question is for the Premier. The Palaszczuk government is standing firm on policies of no asset sales and no increase to the GST, but is pledging increased spending on jobs creation and public services. Your solution to the budget imbalance is that the federal government give Queensland more money, but this is very unlikely. So how do you propose to pay for this increased spending given today's youth don't deserve to carry the debt burden of fiscally promiscuous state governments? Premier. Oh, thank you very much for that question. Fiscally <laughs> promiscuous. Uh, well, the budget we delivered just uh, the other week is a responsible and measured budget. It was firmly focused on jobs and at the centre point of that is my advanced Queensland policy about creating the jobs for the future. So looking at renewables and biotechnology and making sure that we can actually give the best possible opportunity for Queenslanders to get jobs in those future industries. But in your, uh, your question there about tax, I've just come back from COAG and the Prime Minister and, and Mike Baird are very, of the, very much of the firm opinion that we need to have an uh, increase in the GST. Now, why do we need to have an increase in the GST from their point of view? It's because the federal government has cut $80 billion no, from Anastasia, health and education right. funding. Let the Premier finish. And $80 we'll come to you. billion. Dollars. So now the um, federal government wants to increase the GST. And I don't believe that people can afford a massive increase in the GST. 
And what I said to the Prime Minister very clearly at COAG is put that to the Australian people. If you want to put an increase in the tax, put it to the Australian people so they can have a say. Ron Boswell wants to jump in there. I do want to jump in because that $80 billion was never committed. It was committed, but it was never on the table. It was never money. It was some sort of a, a, a forecast by a Labor Party government when they were there that, or in a policy that they would provide $80 billion. It was never there. The money was never there. The government, the federal government, has increased um, expenditure on uh, health and on education. So this $80 billion that the premiers, the Labor premiers are all singing from the one hymn sheet, it was never a promise. It was never there. So $80 billion is fictitious. But on the issue of the, the, the question goes to debt that you'll be leaving to, to younger Queenslanders like um, Georgina this evening, Queensland state debt is tipped to reach, I think, around about $78 billion by 2018-19. And you've also promised a whole lot of new spending in this particular uh, budget. You don't want to lift in the GST where other premiers can see sense in that when you've got uh, health, health ex uh, expenses skyrocketing around the country. Why is that not a reasonable part of the discussion that Queensland could engage with? Uh, well, what I put on the table was very clearly an alternative option. And that is the biggest expense for Australians into the future is the rising cost of health care. Uh, we all know people um, like, like everyone's getting older. But that GST increase is, is to be hypothecated yeah, but but, to pay for health care. No, it's not. No, it's not. This is, this is where the messages are blurred from the federal government. We know health costs are going to be escalating. As people get older, the ageing population, the growth in health is going to out, out, outdo how much we can actually uh, save and spend. So that's why we need to make sure we target health. So the option that Daniel and Andrews, Daniel Andrews and I put on the table was about gradually increasing the Medicare levy. So the money is directly spent on health. Now, what Tony Abbott wants to do this is a, a very neat little trick from Tony Abbott. He wants to increase the GST. Well, no, uh, the suggestion was from Mike Baird. No, no, they were working together, Virginia. They're going to increase yeah, so the GST. So your counterpart in New South Wales doesn't have a mind of his own? <laughs> 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 They're definitely working together. So basically what they want to do is increase the GST... Then they're saying, you know, then there's going to be some compensation. They're not telling you how much the compensation's going to be. And then Tony Abbott wants to go to the election and promise tax cuts. Now, how can we afford tax cuts and a rise in the GST? We need to be real about this. These are real issues. Health is the biggest cost, and we must address okay. the health issue. And Tiernan, um, you uh, wrote an open letter to the Premier. Uh, advising her on how to sort of proceed in her first days of government, particularly the four P's here, people, process, policy and politics. How's she doing so far? Virginia, I wrote a letter to the next Premier of Queensland and for about 17 days we didn't know who that was going to be. So the advice was to whichever was the incoming Premier of Queensland because all leaders need to think about those four P's. Uh, if they're going to hit the ground running, if they're going to have an agenda, if they're going to be clear about what needs to happen. And how's this Premier doing? Look, this Premier um, uh, has attracted a lot of interest, uh, I think. Um, I think people wanted to wait until the budget came down to see how, uh, how the agenda was unfolding. Uh, clearly, going from having uh, seven and then nine uh, members uh, of Parliament, I think she's got a much bigger team than she had. So we've got uh, coordination and coherence of messaging starting to emerge. I think people are interested in what the government has to offer because it was so unexpected, the change of government. I think the Premier would probably admit that herself, that uh, no one was much expecting the result that we mm. that we got here. Well, um, but so <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, she won't admit that. You're not the um, only one. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and I'll tell you why I did, because I was travelling around Queensland and families were stopping me, they were speaking to me. We'd seen massive cuts uh, to jobs right throughout Queensland. Services had been cut, economies had been slowed down, people weren't spending. And everywhere I went, people were telling me that they wanted a change and they wanted something better. OK. Uh, Monica Bradley, okay. can I... Can I hear from you on this? I mean, as someone who works in strategy, but being saddled with a, with a huge debt 
and, uh, and, and a long-standing debt is uh, not something that states can really deal with well these days. Well, I spend my time in the new economy and I find this debate to be very industrial age. You know, really, we're moving into the information age and everything's up for grabs. The world is changing so rapidly around us and we're kind of standing on the deck of the Titanic thinking if we fiddle with this and fiddle with that, then somehow, miraculously, it's all going to come into line. You know, what we really need to do is step into some foresight. We'd like to see from all our politicians some foresight about where they think the future is going. Let's paint a picture, let's go forward thing. We don't know what the future is, but we certainly know some major trends that are going to help us. One of the things that also um, I find a bit irritating is that we have this assumption that the costs will continue to rise. If we can intervene with innovation, we can actually dramatically reduce the cost of government um, in so many sectors. You know, the entitlement thing, that's a data issue. You know, if everyone had an iPhone pad and every time they were going to chip something that was going to be go onto their entitlements, they had to scan and it went into the public environment, I think people would make better choices. Okay. You know, big data can allow us to target services so we're not producing, someone's not mowing the lawn every day, they've checked the data from the Meteorological Society, they've checked the data from them, they've used a drone, and now we only send people to mow things that need to be mowed. So it's about how do we actually use innovation, how do we put our economies in a forward pacing position and move from the industrial age the information age and thrive. You've lost Virginia. me already. <laughs> <laughs> the new world economy. Yeah. Can I just add something about the revenue question that we that we had? I mean, what was you know encouraging, I think, about COAG last week was we actually had a, a debate about the revenue problem, the fundamental revenue problem that we have in Australia. And you know, while we're talking about things that are tiresome, talking about the division of um, revenue in this country between you know states and the Commonwealth, what the Commonwealth might give to states, you know, thanks so much, and then sign. I think there probably was a national partnership agreement uh, around some of those um, health and education measures. So I'm just interested to see if we can change the dynamic of that as well, uh, about, you know, uh, peers in COAG, not a, uh, not a, you know, an overweening federal government uh, that changes the, the ballpark and moves the goalposts uh, when delivery systems are where these efficiencies could be driven. But just as it buys in and out, that's different. Ron Boswell, then we'll move on the, to the next question. The Premier's recognised that there is a, a, a huge problem in funding. And uh, the, the way that you can... Uh, all of this is by increasing the tax, but already Australia is paying about one of the highest personal income taxes, about 49%. If the Premier gets away, that'll go up to 52 or 53%, and that is a huge tax burden on Australians. When most of the, when some of the lower paid people are creeping up into that uh, higher bracket every year. So the GST meets some of the, the angst that we are talking about. But uh, Anastasia, you are right. It doesn't matter how good you are as a manager. If you can't take the people with you, That's right. you are not going to win an election. That's right. And uh, That's my point. I think that our previous Premier was a great operator, a great doer, but he couldn't take the people with him. All right. Let's move on to our next question, and it comes from Andy Jones. Thanks, Virginia. Um, my question's to the panel. After Bill Shorten stated he supported two prime ministers and went against both of them, does he have any political integrity left? And why should Australians believe any of the policies Labor takes to the election when it has proven it only cares about holding on to government at any cost? And if you can answer it without um, mentioning the current coalition government. I think. I think we'll let our panellists mention what they'd like to mention, but um, <laughs> we'll go to the Premier last, I think, on this one. Let's hear from, the, from all the panel on this one about the issue of um, political integrity. Ron Boswell? Well, I don't want to criticise anyone's integrity, but I think what happened at the conference was there was a bit, of, to the, bit for the right, was the turn back the boats, a sop to the left on renewable energy, so everyone got a prize. Everyone walked out with a prize. <laughs> Except, like a uh, it's the nature of group <laughs> dynamics, isn't it? <laughs> uh, except the people are now going to have to pace a bill of uh, renewable energy, which will send everyone's bill, electricity bill, up by about a third or even 50%. That's just with renewable energy. Then you throw the ETS in, but it's not a tax. Well, whether it's a tax or it isn't a tax, it's going to increase your electricity bills. So all those things uh, were discussed at the conference. Where was the discussion on jobs, 
on housing. How are my kids going to afford a house? They're a million dollars each in Sydney. We have, I don't think the conference addressed the main issues that are worrying Australians at the moment. Um, and the integrity issue will be addressed at the next election by the people. And, and Tiernan, I know you're scrupulously neutral on issues like this, but Bill Shorten does carry a, a very heavy burden of history mm. on this issue and when it comes to his credibility and his believability. Is that too heavy a burden for any, anyone who's putting themselves forward as Prime Minister? I think uh, neither of the major leaders with with an apology for having to mention the current government because I think it's, uh, it's appropriate to do that. I think neither of the leaders are cutting through uh, with the public and that's evident in the opinion polls. Um, I think the issue of philosophy and belief and what people stand for uh, actually is something that's really of concern to voters. Uh, and I think that became really clear here in the, uh, the Borbid Sheldon review, uh, the whole question of philosophy. It became uh, clear in Victoria too. What was the driving philosophy behind the NAP fund government? I pe think people want to know. Um, you know, that you do want to be in power to do something uh, rather than to just for the purpose of being there. Um, so I think it would be very unusual, very unusual for opposition leaders to win uh, an election after a first term. So I think um, Bill Shorten, uh, I read in the paper that, you know, Bill Shorten has the advantage of being the only opposition leader that actually thinks he's going to uh, get there in the first term federally. Uh, usually, you know, there's that resetting period after you've lost government in the way. I sh I'm sure he doesn't welcome, he didn't welcome the killing season uh, as a, as a commentary on the, the years and but you know there's there's so much more did. tendency of people to prosecute the history wars after they're gone. Mm. Mm. Mark Coleridge. Um, I don't think it's just about Bill Shorten or Tony Abbott I, I think there are larger questions caught up in it. Graham Richardson um, wrote recently the truth doesn't count for much in Australian politics and Richo would know. <laughs> In a sense, he's a very experienced politician. <laughs> now, uh, I, I, I think it's a bit cynical, but I think the, the fact of the matter is po political leaders, who are not bad people, they are caught in a situation, in a culture really, where it, it's a matter of getting elected, winning power and holding power at any cost. And that has its costs. Uh, and it, it can lead to a, a kind of imprisonment in the immediate, where you've got to... You've got to please an electorate that often has unrealistic or inflated expectations, which are doomed to be disappointed. And as soon as a government disappoints those unrealistic expectations, out they go. And in comes another government that I think is equally doomed to disappoint. And, and out that government will go. So you've got a kind of a vicious circle that, that, that um, amounts to a political culture which is not healthy, and I think this is true at state level and at uh, federal level as well, mm -hmm. and uh, makes the business of political leadership extremely hard. And by leadership, I mean making those difficult and unpopular decisions that will take us into the future. But have Bill Shorten's own decisions along the way made that path for him even harder? Possibly they have. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's just a question of Bill Shorten. I think there are larger questions of the political okay. culture. Monica Bradley. I'm exhausted watching political ping pong. That's what I'm really over. You know, I, I sit in the middle. You know, I'm fiscally conservative, but I'm socially progressive. I find very few of our current leaders actually represent that because they're stuck in these paradigms of these two conflicting war teams that are fighting each other. You know, we're just... We look past that because we can see that that's not going to last on either side. So we're going to continue to have this one terms because people will flip. Um, and people will flip because we're continually, we're kind of like hoping to raise our expectations that somewhere we'll get some leadership. For me, it's about, it comes back to some very basic things. Some leadership for the future about why. Where is our country going? What do we really want to stand for in the new economy? The world is changing very quickly around us. And what I'm hearing is debates about the here and now. What I would like to hear is a little bit more about where are we going? Okay. And just quickly, can I hear from the Premier on this? It's about Bill Shorten's believability. Yeah, sure. Look, I've known Bill for many, many years since, uh, you know, university days. And what's struck me about Bill and my campaign with him during the state election is that he does fundamentally care about people. And, you know, it's tough being in, in politics, but he's prepared to get out there. And the whole conference was around... Our, the theme was Advance Australia. It's about where do we want... Australia to be into the future. And it's a conversation that I think we need to engage the Australian people with. 
What are the jobs for the future? Uh, where do we see health and education? And Ron, all those issues were discussed. In fact, the conference was live on TV. Anyone could tune in and listen. And people were elected to go to that conference to debate the ideas. The Australian Labor Party never shies away from debating the ideas that are confronting our country. It was there for everyone to see. OK, well, we're actually going to stick with that and some of the ideas debated at the conference. Our next question comes from John Slater. Thanks, Virginia. Um, this is a question for the whole panel, but I would like to hear the Premier's views particularly. Um, at last weekend's national conference, the Labor Party voted to adopt, adopt boat turnbacks as official party policy. With the move being publicly opposed by senior Labor frontbencher Anthony Albanese and Deputy Leader Tanya Plibersek choosing to not even attend the vote, how can Labor convince Australians to trust its borders with a policy that almost half the party doesn't even believe in? Prem Premier, do you, do you support the policy, Premier? Uh, yes, I do. And I think what everyone is forgetting here is that these people are risking their lives to come to Australia. No one wants to see anyone killed. Anyone killed coming here. So why and did if, the Labor Party take we, so long then to sign up to it? Well, I think they had to have a, a large conversation with people. But now we want to look at, uh, you know, doubling our, in, our humanitarian intake of refugees. Now, my grandparents, going back, came out after the Second World War. They were displaced persons. They came out to Australia with absolutely nothing. Came out here following the, the Second World War. And my father recounted this story to me just the other day. The first meal my, my grandfather had here, he said, I have fresh bread and I have, fr I have, I have fresh butter. Australia is the land of plenty. So why not allow we these people? Multi then why not allow those people to settle here rather than be towed back somewhere else? Mm. Well, that's Virginia. That's why we're doubling the intake of refugees, so they can have the same opportunities like my grandparents had. This is a multicultural Australia, where everyone should be treated equally, where everyone should have the right to come and prosper and to give a better life of hope for their family. That right. is exactly what my grandparents did. And if they hadn't been displaced persons coming here, I would not be here as the Premier of this state. Time is on the wing. Ron Boswell? Look, I agree that we should have an open policy of uh, welcoming immigrants. And, uh, so we should increase those numbers? Uh, I'm not going to go just there at the moment. But what I want to say is, look, there's 10 million people looking for somewhere to live somewhere to go. We can't open the door to everyone. We take more refugees than, I think, any other country. On a no, we don't. No, we, we don't. We certainly take more refugees than no, maybe Canada, That's maybe I, one, but no, we there, are very there, there, generous. There are many other countries that take many more than us. Yes. But there are, we are very generous in our refugee intake. Look, I think Ron's onto a thing here, right? The problem, we're actually dealing with tickering around at the end of the supply chain, you know, between Indonesia and here on a boat and determining a status on that. The real problem sits in the Middle East and Jordan where there's people that have three generations that have been sitting in camps over there that is somewhere between 10 and 20 million. As a world, we have to say, we are creating somewhere around 5 million people a year displaced through war. What is our strategy of how we're going to disperse those. You know, we did it, we've got some examples of where we've done it well. Post-World War II, we did it well. We even created a country for a particular race. But now, for instance, we now have decided that some of those solutions are not on the table. And so people are, are being innovative and entrepreneurial, and they're finding their own ways to countries. Why can't we go to the source, have a global agreement, get the Pope involved? He's involved in trafficking already. He's standing up on climate change. <laughs> He's showing the most leadership I've seen of anything internationally so far. You know, if we disperse these people through a a really good chain of going into, you know, parishes and into family units instead of the opposite is we're actually creating the bigger threat than we already dare. Can I just bring, bring uh, the panel though back to the question, which is it's an issue actually about... It's an issue about, again, credibility and believability, given that half the party doesn't seem to support this. The party has changed its mind completely on an issue that it was steadfast on. Mark Coleridge, it goes yeah. to the issue of believability and then being able to prosecute their case. Well, it, it, there's a, there is a, an issue of credibility, but there's a much larger issue, I think, of moral failure on both sides of politics. And I don't think there's any way around that. That uh, it, it puzzles me that... Uh, that 
systematically cruel policies are devised and implemented by men and women in politics who are not themselves cruel. Some of them I know, but it's one of the mysteries of public life in Australia at this time. I don't think there's any way around the fact that on both sides of politics now federally, our, our policy on asylum seekers and refugees is simply a moral failure and is a, yeah. a, an international disgrace. Uh, if you think the numbers coming to Australia as so-called illegal immigrants, which itself is a, is a questionable description, but compare it, say, to Italy. I mean, you know, and the numbers here and are surely tiny. Surely you want Australia to take uh, those unlimited numbers that are floating across the... But they're not unlimited, <laughs> Rob. Oh, yeah, compared they're compared to Italy, they're, they're, they're really I'm, it's I'm, I'm, I'm using the least, Italy. The least don't... don't you certainly wouldn't want Australia to become like Italy, which is taking every immigrant that can get on a boat. I agree totally with that. I mean, how, what is Italy going to do? It is not a wealthy country. It can't, it can't meet mm. its commitments and meet its uh, obligations yeah. to its own. I'm not arguing that we should be like Italy, but all I'm saying is the numbers coming here are minuscule by comparison with elsewhere. The least we could do... The least we could do is process them on shore. And again, I think mm. part of the international disgrace of our current mm. policy is uh, what we have at Nauru and Manus Island. Uh, the, the very least we could do, I think, is to process them on shore. And get the children out of the town. Yeah. Get the children out of the town. Yeah. Anne Tiernan, do you want to have a say here? Look, it's a vexed problem, as is evident from the different views in the audience, and it's one that neither party has managed to succeed on, and hence why Labor is, uh, you know, just wants to stop having to talk about it. Uh, it really... Um, you can see the emotion in the debate over the weekend. Um, I thought Tony Burke's, uh, you know, reaction, you know, was a very human one. Mark, um, you know, having knowing having that on your conscience, I think, would be a very difficult thing to live with. Uh, the dilemma is, of course, around the organised crime links and the exploitation and trafficking yeah. of people, mm. and this is why it is so wicked. Um, but you know, what's very unfortunate is the politicisation of this issue that has gone on on both sides uh, for such a long time now. It's just a, a domestic policy, um, you know, playing out constantly with people's lives. I think if anybody had the answer, uh, they'd have acted on it. It's terribly problematic, but I don't know how you get the politics out of it because we haven't succeeded so far. Mm. Well, let's um, stay with some questions arising from that national conference. Ben Kelly has one for us this evening. During their recent national conference, the ALP announced a policy of 50% renewable energy by 2030 for the next election. While, like most Australians, I broadly support renewable energy, I fear that the massive investment required to attain this very admirable goal will inevitably put upward prices on electricity, upward pressure on electricity prices. With many families struggling from significant increases in electricity costs in recent years, how can the opposition guarantee that this policy will not result in further electricity price rises for Australian families? Let's hear from... I know this is a, a very big area of interest for you, Ron Boswell. Let's hear from you first. Well. They can't guarantee it. You, will, you can only guarantee the prices are going to go up. If the government goes for a 50% target or the Labor Party goes for a 50% target and then adds an ETS on it, the prices of electricity will go up by somewhere between 40 and 50%. Already I asked the, uh, one of the abattoirs the other day, what is renewables costing to kill a beast? and it is $3, $3. That is what it is costing in abattoirs to have renewable energy. And the abattoirs don't pay for it, the farmer pays for it. I don't want to see a situation like uh, South Australia, where they have the highest renewable use, the highest use of wind power. And wind power pushes out, because you have a target for wind power or renewables, it pushes out the cheaper gas and the cheaper coal. So what happened in, Tas in uh, South Australia, 520 people lost their jobs in a coal mine, in the coal mines that were feeding the electricity grid. 
because renewables were more expensive, and the more expensive they are, the less industry you have because it cuts your industry down and you're on a, a, a circle and you use less and less electricity and the coal mines are closing down. And Anastasia, your CMFEU are the union that looks after that. 520 people lost their job in coal mines that feed electri electricity grids because of renewable power. Did we get any more renewable power? No. Did we get higher costs? Yes. Did we lose jobs? Yes. And that is what renewable energy will do right across Australia. Push okay. out the cheaper coal and gas and make renewables that are more expensive, push power prices up for people and industry. Let's... <laughs> Let's hear from the Premier. I also want to hear from Monica Bradley on this as well, but the Premier yeah, first. Thanks, um, Virginia. Well, Ron, I have to disagree with what you're saying there because the world is changing. Um, I've just come back from a trade mission from the United States and renewables is a hot topic over there. They are looking at creating brand new industries. And here in Queensland, for example, we can capitalise on that and create thousands and thousands of jobs. You must have a target. If you don't have a target, we're going to sit back and deny that climate change is happening. We need to be forward thinking. And this is what, when we're talking about advanced Australia and advanced Queensland, it is about looking to the future and looking to those jobs. Anastasia. So I reject that we're going to see uh, increases in electricity this, prices. This is just a scare campaign. It's not a scare campaign. It's a, it's scare a fake campaign. campaign. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot use wind power, which costs uh, 120 or 130 dollars a megawatt hour against coal that has cost 30. It's pushing out hydro, which is 60. Where solar is somewhere about 180. You cannot. You believe in the tooth fairy. It's a bit like your creative accounting. You take away uh, the, the debt and add it onto the electricity. We're running, we're running short of time, but I did just want to quickly put to you, Premier. Though I, I mean, to be true to what's actually been announced uh, by the the Labor Party, it's an aim. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's, it's, it's just an aim. Yeah. And there's no specifics on the table about how they would get there, in what way they'd get there, and the costing of it. And you can't, and all of that you can't guarantee, can the, you, though, all the of prices that will, won't go up. All of that will roll out during the campaign. Um, well, let's know. Let's uh, know. So, oh, no, so, so it's a trust no, issue. No, we've got it. We've got it. We've, we actually went to our election campaign about having, you know, one million solar homes by uh, 2020. We're working hard to achieve that. Uh, and someone we, else is paying for we it. We can actually create a whole new industry. Think so about the jobs, Ron. You're talking about can. jobs going in the coal mining industry. Well, think about the jobs that you can create from all of these okay. renewable industries. Monica Bradley, just very quickly. We have a perfect example of how Brisbane is grasping the future. Brisbane is rolling out a centralised heating and cooling network, which will cost several hundred million dollars. It's completely pri funded by the private sector, but was seeded by some work that the Brisbane City Council through City Smart did. It will abate any energy rises for the CBD of Brisbane by 10% per year. It will cap them, and it will start to reduce in over the five to 10 year window. What it's doing is future-proofing our energy supply to the city. We, when we talk energy, it's a very complex industry. The biggest problem is actually the distribution network of the energy and how we price those in. And some of those are not market mechanisms. They're actually artificially structured. And some of the assets, like the coal assets, have been fully written down. So obviously they are a cheaper source because they're fully written down. If I've got to build a wind farm or interject with future-proofed energy, obviously I've got a higher write-down cost. It's, I'm not saying I have the answers, but the minute batteries come into play at a household level, this whole game is changing. And so it's a little... Space. OK, Correct. we'll leave Can that. I just no. No, we'll come, we'll come okay. to the issue. The Pope has had something to say on this. He has and, had something And to we say. will come to that, <laughs> I guarantee you. This is Q&A, as you can tell, live from Brisbane. Our next question comes from Heather Smith. Thank you, Virginia. It seems to me that politicians love to use the word innovation, but as soon as disruptive, innovative technology, such as Uber, the car share technology, arrives, the government turns around and protects an outdated, slow-moving, expensive monopoly, the taxi industry. How can the government embrace innovation if it will not let go of old industries and revenue streams? Thank you. Yeah. We're now going to do the speed dating version of Q&A. This is going to be really fast. Monica Bradley. I'm an Uber user. What can I say? 
It's a better service. It's a safer service. Now nah, the question is not so much about Uber, but oh, about the dis dis okay. disruptive technologies. Again, and in then what, you do, what do you do with the older ones? Well, we, they transition. This is how, you know, did you know that when the, when the first motor vehicles ran on the road, we had a regulation that said a horse had to walk in front of them because they were dangerous. You know, I, I really feel a little like this is the Uber, oh, you know. Monica. We're holding back of our new technologies. This is a massive, I mean, Uber is, is a mobility Isn't issue. Isn't the reality that you simply have to accept, and not everyone in this room will, that some businesses just have to go out of business? That's the reality when you come to the idea of innovation. 40% of the companies and no politician the wants to market sell that. will not be around in another five years. That is, the, we, that is evidence, time and memorial. As the world moves on, things change, things go away. I don't, you know, and in fact, at the moment, the way the taxi industry has been uh, structured for quite some time, it is highly inequitable. We have taken a lot of licensing fees and we have almost a slave labour force that can drive taxis in these hideous 14-hour shifts. It's no wonder the service has been so bad that it's been disrupted. I mean, to me, it's about the what we've got is someone who's come in and said, wow, has a supply chain that's that's not balanced, it's not fairly sharing the equity, it's not giving great service, how can I disrupt it? That's the, uh, the nature of disruption. And no, I think the dozens of... Well, I'd like to... Do you want to Well, I, I'm totally opposed to Uber. When you, Surprise! <laughs> when you have a taxi... <laughs> when you have a taxi industry that has to go out and pay for their licence, pay to paint their car, pay to ins have an insurance policy that covers uh, the passenger against anything or breaking his neck and paying very high compensation. Radios, uh, an industry that has to provide for the uh, people that are uh, uh, wheelchair bound, have to cover all that. And someone rocks up with his car and says, I can drive between, I've got nothing to between to do between three and four, I will take, I'll pick the eyes out of this industry. If you want to do it, go out and pay the people that have bought with their life savings, their life savings, the taxi licence for their retirement. You just don't go out and wipe their income off like you said, like uh, someone have a solicitor's um, licence and say, we don't care about that anymore. I'm not saying we don't care about it, Roy. What I'm saying is things move on. We can't continue to protect things that no longer function sure, but well that when we have but a that better inherent idea. unfairness. I agree does, we need to regulate. It does rank with totally many people, agree. Anne. Yeah, and I mean, this is the dilemma, isn't it, of, regular, of smart regulation that can be as agile as the markets that are moving. And I think we've got a similar issue in Airbnb. Uh, the market is moving in this direction. People are moving in this direction. They are exercising their choices because the services are maybe better or more effective or whatever, but you know, I don't, there's lots of things I disagree with, Ron, but uh, what I don't disagree with you about is the fact that it actually is a transition issue in terms of how do you recognise the legacy question and the obligation of so people's so, expectations. So some money retained. has to be involved in that transition. Yeah, and, and well, people need to be involved we, in that if transition. If you're going to have people with taxis, make the people with Uber, paint the taxi white green, put a, <laughs> put a plate on top of it, charge them to, for a licence, and then we'll compete on a fair basis. Well, why don't we make Let's... Cab Charge pay some of that? Because mm. is Cab Charge not the elephant in the room? He's the one that, with most of the money that is actually going into the lobbying efforts and paying for the people to protest at the airports. I mean, Cab Charge is really something that's a very big, lovely listed company on the stock exchange that's made an awful lot of money through actually not delivering any service at all except paying, providing a payment gateway. Let's right. move on to another question, if we can, because time is on the wing. <laughs> Our next question now is from Hans Reciver. Monica, I really like what you're saying about uh, disruptive technology, and I'm wondering if we can maybe expand that to the idea of politics. Um, with political party membership at an all-time low and the public seeming to be bailing out in disgust, do you see a future role for digital entrepreneurship and re-empowering rapid, direct and active democratic representation using digitally integrated bottom-up methods of political decision-making? Yes. <laughs> he asked me a close question. Mm. That'll, can just answer that'll, yes. that'll do for the answer, I think. The answer is yes. Just, just if I could pick up the point of uh, people not signing up for political parties. It's not only political parties. They don't sign up for sporting clubs, even churches. <laughs> so it's, uh, people don't want to belong in the way that they once did. Rotary clubs are, are struggling. Everyone's struggling. So... Uh, 
This, again, I think might be another point of serious cultural change, which is becoming a bit of a theme of this discussion tonight. It is. Well, and, and well, we're in the smart state, so, of course, that, exactly. that, that, the that has to happen. The smart state. We've changed it now. It's the smart oh, state. Oh, Sorry, you know, I missed the memo. Uh, just quickly, Monica, then we'll come to yeah. Anne. I just want to add, you know, we hear this lot, people are not signing up. I have to tell you, I work in the social enterprise space, which is the space that's filling the gap that used to be filled by government when their funding got cut. We have some of the best social entrepreneurs coming out of our academies here in Brisbane, Things like, and what I'm finding is that I, ha I have a lot of passion. The younger generation is is highly idealised and are about going out and doing things. Our design jams, where we call people to come, students to come and give freely of their time to help solve problems for governments, but that's are not oversubscribed. To an organization, though, is it? Well, that's where Hugh Mackay's work on belonging is important yeah. to our yeah. society. Can, and I, think. can I just mention, uh, with the Labor Party here in Queensland, after the 2012 election, we were we had about 4,000 Labor Party members. We now have nearly 12,000. So Explain there are... Explain that. How does that happen? <laughs> Everyone wants to well, be the Palaszczuk <laughs> factor. <laughs> Everyone wants to back a winner. Well, <laughs> no, I, I actually think uh, we did a lot of soul searching uh. and we went through, we basically uh, tore up our policy rule book, started again, went out, spoke to people and developed our pat platform uh, based on principles and values that we hold dear, equality, fairness, and a fair go for all. Okay, and uh, how exactly, according to our question, to Hans, would this be achieved? Oh, look, I'm not, um, it's not really my stuff, that, but uh, I mean, one, uh, there's obviously a movement among people to want to do this. I think some politicians think that Twitter has already uh, democratised uh, their encounters with, uh, with the citizenry. Um, I think, uh, you know, the real challenge is how do the parties adapt to people want to be involved, people want to have a say, uh, and the way they're organised now uh, don't, doesn't really enable that. So I think there is a challenge of adaptation, but, but I've seen the, the turnout in young people. They're very motivated, and, and Monica's quite right, um, but they want to do something. They don't want to wait around and sit in a conference all weekend or go to you know, meetings and, and attend all the time. So it's a different kind of belonging, uh, and I think it's more ideational mm. than, um, than tribal, yeah. uh, if I may. Yeah. Our next question now comes from Casey Payne. Hi, my question's for the Premier. Um, with 52 women already killed this year and the stress on the community and um, the struggle to change the culture of ignorance when it comes to domestic violence, do you intend to implement any more of the recommendations from the Domestic and Family Violence Task Force? And um, if so, how effective will they be given that um, the Queensland budget only allocated $31.3 million over four years to domestic violence? Thanks, Casey. That's a very good question. <laughs> it was actually an issue that was uh, discussed at the COAG meeting last week. And, you know, I, I do commend the fact that the Prime Minister's put it on the agenda, the table, for a national campaign, which I think is very important. But here in Queensland, we had a, a landmark report where Quentin Bryce handed down um, her report into domestic violence and the actions we can take. We've put in $31 million. That's a great first step. Um, we're actually leading compared to other states. We're putting on extra duty lawyers to help women. Our first ever trial of a specialist domestic violence court down at Southport. And if that works out well there, I can see that rolling out to other parts of Queensland. And perhaps it can be adopted at a national level. Rosie Batty personally raised that issue with me when I met with her. We want to make it easier for people to go through the court system and not get lost. And we also want to make sure that we have more centres for help and extra support for the DV Help Service. So I think we are leading the way when it comes to the rest of Australia. Of course, more can be done. Just quickly, it is though, unacceptable and we must do more. 140 recommendations from Quentin Bryce's yes. report. How many of those will you implement? Oh, well, we're going through it now for our government response, but... Uh, do you, you imagine it'll be seem... the majority? Yeah, yeah, I do, actually, because most of them are quite reasonable. And... Quentin Bryce went around Queensland and listened to first-hand stories of people. And you don't get any, anything more real than listening to women tell their stories about having to flee domestic violence, the impact on their children. And let's face it, um, you know, you can, never, you can never escape it. It's always going to be with mm. you um, through the rest of your life. But as a government, we are taking it very seriously. And I believe that at a national level, it's being taken seriously. And Rosie Batty is being uh, very um, out, outspoken and passionate. And people are finally taking, uh, taking, um, taking notice. But we also need to look at education as well. We need to change culture and change attitudes. 
and that starts in the school. It is about respect and it's about equality. It is about treating women equally at that early age. And if we can start doing that, as I said last week, we can change attitudes, we can change culture, and we can change our nation. Mark yeah. Coleridge. <laughs> what's, the, what's the church's response to this? Well, uh, the church's response is, is, first of all, that it can't be just left to government. Again, it's a, it strikes me as a very Aussie thing to say, you know, the government's got to do something about domestic... Mm -hmm. Of course you do. Everyone, yeah. But, but this is a, a community responsibility, including the churches. One of the appalling things about domestic violence is just how hidden it's been. It was one of those things that, like the abuse of the young, that went on behind closed doors. And there was a cone of silence over it. was, you know, happened in the family home, let it be. Well, well those days are gone because what, we've co what we are coming to see is that this is a widespread problem right throughout the community and it's going to take the whole community, including the churches. Now, we have our big social welfare agency called Centre Care. They've been dealing with the reality for a long time, but in a way that hasn't drawn focus. Well, that's changing now. Archbishop, can I jump in there? Because it's interesting that you, you mentioned the issue of, of abuse because yeah. I was raised Catholic and in a very you know, strong Catholic parish. And it seems to me that the issue, like clerical sexual abuse yeah. of children, that the issue of family violence was one that perhaps the priests also turned a blind eye to, didn't speak up on, and perhaps that the issue, that was another issue where they could have spoken out but didn't speak out. Yeah. Is, is that something you think that the church Maybe. Needs, yeah. needs to reflect on and needs to, needs to wonder about the role I, that it I, played? I think the church certainly needs to reflect upon it. Uh, I, I'm not sure how much was... No, I just don't know. I really don't know. But, uh, but the, the church has to reflect upon it and if they were turning a blind eye, it was, it was following suit with the whole society, which has for a very long time known that this has gone on and has turned a blind eye. What's happened now, thank God, is that, that those days are over, that the, the, the locked door is no longer locked, the voices are no longer silent, but it has to be a responsibility that government, churches and, and individuals like everybody in this room now have to, uh, have to play their part in doing something about domestic violence because it, it, it corrupts in the deepest possible way. All violence is shocking, but it's at its worst when it's in a home which is supposed to be a haven of safety. So just on, on that score and just before I move on, it, it really is the case now, isn't it, for those of us who were raised in a religious environment, that the nature of, um, of that privacy, the secrecy of that seal... Uh, between priest and and parishioner, that that's broken for all time now, isn't it? As a priest, you you have a, no. don't you see that you have a greater moral obligation to to the truth and to broader society absolutely than to that private that. seal? Yeah, absolutely uh, that responsibility, but uh, th there's still a, a sacred bond between priest and and people. Now you know I, I could talk at great length about that, but if you're referring to the seal of the confessional, I am. are you? That's non-negotiable, because in that, that, in that, at that point, what's going on is something between that person, the penitent, and God. And when that, and when that person walks into the confessional and she has a black eye, what then? Uh, I would, uh, pastoral good sense would say, I'll talk to her afterwards and see what needs to be done. And Tiernan, can I ask you to come in on this? This is a, a subject for all of us and for every Australian. Look, I was very encouraged by uh, the COAG leaders meeting last week. Um, I'm very encouraged by the fact that um, leaders heard directly uh, from Rosie Batty, who I think I think all of us agree has just mm. done an extraordinary job to to mm. turn uh, that you know shocking tragedy uh, into into a, a movement where mm. people are really paying attention. Um, I think um, the Premier, um, you know, the one person in Australia who watched the um, press conference all the way through to see what Premiers were saying uh, on this issue, uh, and I think the issue of behaviour and culture was a point very well made, um, Premier, in, you know, when you did that, because I think this is right. It, you know, um, attitudes towards women are formed very early, uh, and they're probably formed before school. 
uh, and the way we treat each other uh, is a fundamental, uh, a fundamental issue. Uh, and I think we all do have a responsibility. I think she's done a terrific job in, in bringing that to leaders' attention. Of course, the challenge is always sustaining that issue attention. Mm. Um, and because it's, you know, it's, these, uh, it's not the first time these kinds of issues have happened, how do we sustain leaders' yeah. attention mm. beyond the current cohort who will have been mm. so affected? Let's move on to our next question, and it comes this time from Marianne Eady. Thanks, Virginia. Um, so last month, Pope Francis released um, an encyclical dedicated to the environment, calling for action to stop environmental degradation and global warming. Does the panel think that climate change is increasingly a moral and ethical issue and no longer just a scientific um, environmental issue? Archbishop, what did you think? Mm. Mm. Good question. What did you think of the encyclical? I think the encyclical, as we call it, the big fat letter written by Pope Francis, is a breakthrough document. Uh, because what it provides is precisely a, a genuinely human, moral, spiritual and even mystical framework for, for scientific and political decisions. In other words, there, there's more to all of this, to ecology understood broadly, there's more to it than politics, economics, science and certainly ideology. But, but very often in the discussion, all you think is, is that it's economics, politics, science and ideology. They all have their part to play. I'm not sure about ideology, but the other three do. But, but what's been lacking is precisely the kind of framework that the Pope offers. Now, the, the key point he makes is that everything is connected. Mm. That's a very simple claim, but the implications are immense. And, and from that, that basic claim, he then goes on to talk about an integral ecology. He's not just talking about climate change. The letter's about much more than that because what he's talking about is environmental ecology and human ecology. For instance, he says the desertification of the planet starts with the desertification of the human heart. That the, 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 human, the, the ecology of the human world and the ecology of the natural world are profoundly interrelated. And you can't talk about one without the other. So do you think the discussion um, now reaches a different level now that the Pope has stepped in, do you think, internationally? I, I think it does. And I think he has an eye very specifically to Paris later this year. Mm -hmm. And I think he hopes for uh, significant achievements at Paris that we haven't seen in earlier conferences that have been held. He's a rather political Pope, this one, isn't he? I don't think he's political. I think he's politically very savvy, but he doesn't play policy. He's, in this letter, he's not playing politics. He's not playing economics. People have said, well, uh, he should stick out of science. He should stick out of politics. He should stick out of economics. I don't think he's getting involved in those except by implication, but he's providing a framework which politics, economics and science require. Rob Boswell? Well, uh, as a practising Catholic and one of your... Uh, one of your flock, uh, Archbishop. Happy to have you, Rob. Uh, <laughs> um, I was somewhat concerned about yeah. the Pope's statement. Uh, Did you read it? I didn't read it. And, that, <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and I... Uh, I am going to be completely honest with you. My, uh, my looking at it came from television. But the, what immediately struck me is there's 300 million, or there's three, I think it's 300 million Indians or uh, people that live in India. That no, billions. they're billions. Three, they're, in the, that they're in the billions. Billions that live in India. They're living without a light, living in terrible circumstances. And would this statement prevent coal mining that would allow them to industrialise, mm. allow them to have somewhere to Let's go? Let's listen respectfully, please. I don't, I don't think the Pope said... Oh, he, 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 does, he doesn't sort of excommunicate coal mining. No, but what he said very clearly, to my way of thinking, I only saw it for three minutes, yeah. and I should not make this statement, but I'm forced into it, because I was disappointed. Ron, I'm not forcing you no, to say I, anything. I was, I was disappointed, <laughs> and I thought if I have an opportunity, I will have to challenge what was in this statement. Do you believe the Pope should stay out of these issues, do you? Uh, no, the Pope should make a statement on the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that's within his portfolio. But <laughs> making a statement <laughs> that would preclude people using the use of cheap, cheaper power, whether it be hydro or whether it be uh, coal, and preventing them from having a better standard of living, I just 
found it very hard to accept. I, I think you've missed the point, Ron, really. It's about when you know better, you do better. <laughs> Uh, I, we, now not, we now have technology that allows us to produce cheaper energy if we really innovate and do it well. well Australia has one of the largest um, you know, areas of um, non-grid energy in the world. We're leading the world. We have companies traded on the stock market that are, are doing global business in independent uh, energy you talking, systems. You're yeah. talking solar or wind? We're talking or? a combination of all, waste well, to energy, tri-generation, thermal coal, thermal uh, solar, you name it. We're, well, we're in there and doing it. Well, the We're Labor at the forefront of this technology. That's we right. could share that with India. Well, we don't have to share coal with India. We could actually share renewables. If, if the Labor Party's policy of getting to 50% is going to be correct, it is going to require an ele another 1,100 turbines, 1,100 turbines. Four times what we've got now. Now, those turbines will cost $65 billion dollars to get to your... But you assume wind is the only solution. No, I'm, I'm talking solar. solar. Solar's yeah. even dearer. If you go into solar, that's dearer. If you go into wave, no one's even found out how to do it. Uh, and here we are, you're talking about increasing costs. Well, they, look, all of these numbers are, of course, highly contested. And, and no, they're the not contested. No, they no, are no, scientific. No, they, no, they are. No, the, on, the question, on all sides. No, no, no. The, question I, can I, can I, the question, I think, is can we not afford to explore renewables in a more sophisticated way? That's right. And, and, and Which is what we're doing here in Queensland. Well, I hope we're doing it here in Queensland we because if we don't explore renewables in this imaginative and cutting-edge way, uh, the point may come eventually, in the longer term, when, when we're not renewable. Let's, well, let's, uh, <laughs> can, uh, I, can I just hear from the Premier? <laughs> Anastasia? Um, uh, thank you, um, Archbishop, for what you said. But this is not the first Pope that's actually made comments not in relation to the environment Not at all. He makes that very clear. He goes well. back to Pope yes. Paul VI way back in 1971, before we even heard of the environment or ecology, and he traces a whole tradition of papal teaching from 1971 up until now. So it's, it's not a bolt out of the blue. Yeah. Well, if, if we're going to use renewable energy and you want to use it for the future, let's yes, do it with are. research and development. And that's what we're that's doing. But not that's putting what we are it, doing. No, you're not. Yes, we what, are. No, you're not. You're putting yes, it onto everyone's are. bill. Everyone's picking up the research and development on their electricity bill. These are it, new industries that create no, can not. create thousands of jobs, Ron. Yeah. Thousands yeah, of jobs like for Queenslanders yes, but, and for <laughs> Australians. <laughs> thousands Ron, of jobs. But Ron, new Ron Boswell, Ron Boswell is, is correct when he talks about the, the price impost and ABC Fact Check has established that, you know, that, that it might push down initially the price of the wholesale price, but just the cost of compliance with the RET will you know, pull, push that price up again. That might might just be the price that people may or may not be prepared to pay, but you can't get around the price point. I guess the issue, Antiannan, is whether that's a, the moral imperative that the, the Pope is saying that it is. I was intrigued by the idea of the Pope having a portfolio, Ron. I really was. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think the Pope has a very broad portfolio. <laughs> well, there's 26,000 people cannot afford in Queensland to switch their electricity on. They can't afford to pay the bill. And they, and, and they can't afford to switch their electricity on. Let me just, okay, just move it back to the issue of the um, encyclical vote, Anne. Sure. Look, I think there's a whole bunch of demand management mm. issues that, um, that, you know, that, that often aren't raised in this discussion. And clearly a price signal will encourage people to use power differently as it encourages people to do things differently whenever you put a price signal on it. So I think, uh, you know, I understand the, the different views that exist about it. Uh, I agree with you, Mark, that it's a very interesting contribution, uh, that it's, it's, you know, certainly worth exploring the discussion. I think it's really healthy uh, that people are paying attention to what a Catholic Absolutely. Pope has said. You know, mm. it's the First time in a long time. Yeah. Okay. Look, uh, that's... <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> He's been paying attention. <laughs> that's uh, unfortunately all we have time for tonight with this tremendous uh, Brisbane crowd. Please thank our panel, Monica Bradley, Mark Coleridge, Anastasia Palaszczuk, Ron Boswell and Anne Tiernan. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to this tough question in Queensland audience and everyone here at ABC Brisbane, I think you should give yourselves a round of applause as well. Great audience tonight.
do you know, we had to bring in extra chairs because they just wouldn't go home. So next Monday on Q&A, we'll leave politics behind. We'll make room for big minds tackling the biggest issues in the universe, literally, with the director of New York's Hayden Planetarium, acclaimed science communicator Neil deGrasse Tyson, marine ecologist and mathematical modeler Beth Fulton, broadcaster and mathematician and footy coach Adam Spencer, and oncologist Ranjana Srivastava, whose books include Dying for a Chat and So It's Cancer. Now what? I'll be back on News Breakfast from 6am on Wednesday. I'll see you then. And Tony Jones will be back in this Q&A chair next Monday for that fascinating discussion. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Thank you.